Good afternoon, everyone. We're back with uh, another episode, and I would like to take you immediately to a strange slide. You can see a picture. On the one hand, you'll see a form that we recently optimized for one of the largest cable companies in the country, and next you'll see a particular fish, kind of an ugly, deep water fish, and I want to ask you a curious question to start with. What do these two items have in common? Make no mistake, they're closely connected. And before we're over today doing live op, and that is going through the pages you've submitted and trying to drive performance increases, we're going to discuss how these two connect. And I picked it because in preparing, I looked at one of the pages sent. I have not been through the pages, and it was a quick glance, but I immediately saw a problem with the page, suggested that Paul pull up this study uh, that I'm holding up in my hand, uh, which is a, a study that talks about that ugly fish, and here we are today. So there the two are. Look at them and ask yourself a question. How could these two items possibly connect? <laughs> Dave, Dave Fogel says they both stink. <laughs> Dave, it's good to see you, as well as David Carrier, who uh, said it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, I think, quoting Mr. Rogers. Yakov, glad you finished the book. I'm watching as I speak your, uh, your input. Guide me today so that we can do something that really delivers value for every single person that tunes in. With that in mind, I'm going to show you some metrics. And from there, I'm going to teach you from a simple case study that we'll come back to when we talk about the fish and the page submitted by a member of our audience. There is the case study, 23.4%, 13.1%. What you're looking at, essentially, is prior to optimization, the performance of a particular page for this big media slash cable group. And you'll see that one of those metrics has some very significant opportunities for us. We focused on mobile. I won't get into all the research we do, but I will say this for those of you who have not seen this before. Every time we look at data, we use something called a triad. We ask three questions. The first question starts with the how. Everybody wants to know how I can get a higher conversion rate or how I can sell more products or services. But the answer to how begins with a different question, and that is what. And the what question is, who remembers? If you know, put it in there. Put it in here. What does the data tell me? Now, not just what does the data say, not just what is the uh, you know, metrics uh, uh, report, but what does the data tell me about the behavior of my customer? So the what questions connected to behavior and then the what question powers the essential answer. And that answer comes when you ask a different question. And that is why. Why are people behaving this way? Now that insight, understanding the relationship between these interrogatives can unlock the power of your data. It's very simple, but applied it's very powerful. And we applied it to the chart that you've just seen. And you'll note that there was a 9.8% uh, problem, let's call it, with mobile signed out uh, visitors. So think about that for just a second. You don't need to know really any more than that because that's enough to get me to the reason we attacked the problem in the way that we did. Now you're looking at uh, an excerpt from the mobile micro course. I've written a five-part course and taught it. It's free and it's just a straightforward course and teaching you how to optimize particularly for mobile. This page is from that course, and you'll see in there the original page, the control. Now, here's the idea. They wanted people who came here and who are about to move to uh, sign up for the new address so they didn't lose the customer. It also had a big impact on the way uh, the market looks at a cable company's performance. So getting those people again counted in some way as getting a new customer, which had powerful implications beyond the revenue. Ultimately, this is a version of the mobile page. You can say, well, it's all grayed out and I don't see it. That's on purpose. A, we can't share the brand. I could not use this study if I did. And B, it really helps just look at the layout and the overall approach. On the right, you're going to see the copy. On the left, you're going to see the design. I want to separate the two for purposes of teaching. Now, don't forget, you've submitted pages. 
And I have a whole slew of those we're going to look at in just a few minutes and we're going to learn together. But this is setting up the first page that you submitted. And so here we are. That's the control. I will now share with you the treatment. Now, there are three elements of the treatment that might be very important. Let's go in reverse order. We did reduce friction. That's important. And the entire process is renamed. That's very important. And we're going to talk about the power of a name to communicate a conclusion. If you've tuned in to my previous broadcast, for instance, the 21 psychological elements of a landing page, we talk about the importance of fostering conclusions. People don't make the decision before they make a conclusion. The conclusion is about you and it is about your product. Those two conclusions power the decision. So now I want to talk to you about a very subtle way to control the conclusion. So we named this form. We named it the Quick Mobile Transfer. Where did that name come from? Uh, a group of people sitting in a room and a series of tests. The name has more power than the claim. Now pay attention to that because most of us create websites that are replete with claims. And what I'm suggesting is that you think differently and that in doing so you realize that for some reason and it's just human nature a name tends to reveal an essence and people put more weight on a conclusion derived from a name. I could take you back uh, and through the work of Aristotle and show you that this was powerful and true thousands of years ago. It is still true today. Now just pause for a second. I'm getting ready to look at a page. We're going to show you why this is important. But think about your own site and ask yourself a question. Is there a way for me to leverage names to create more power in my conclusion uh, fostering efforts? All right. As you think about that, uh, we also uh, added navigation. Now, the, it was the variable cluster, that's the technical name, that involved all of these changes to drive a single conclusion. And that conclusion is... This is going to be fast and easy. What we wanted people to conclude is this is going to be fast and easy. So we combined a little bit of friction reduction with a special name, change the navigation, and in a world where they had ran testing for two years and seen no improvements on this page, at a time when the call center was backed up by complaining customers who had problems with this page. We ran an experiment and produced. You can see the two side by side. You can see the strategy. And let me show you now the results. Whoops. Is that a, is that in front of the results? There are, did, I, did I click past them, Paul? All right. So, uh, yes. Uh, Sign up for these courses and uh, thank you, Paul, but I'm going to go to the results. All right, that one caught me by surprise. Uh, we'd love to have you do this and there is a value here uh, for you, but let me take you to the results. A 10.6% relative increase. By the way, just because there's a lot of skeptics, that wasn't a, a fake moment where I pretend I don't know that we have something for sale. We are selling those courses. I just had no idea that slide was going to come up there. Here are the results, though, and you can see the difference was a 10.6% increase. Now, you might miss two key principles if you move too briskly past this point. The first principle is that you can use a name to foster a conclusion. The second is that in every conversion environment, there are two numbers and all we ever pay attention to is the one number and it's not right. So I'm going to erase the discovery triad. This is how we build, we always have an H right here, the hypothesis. I'm going to erase the discovery triad and I'm going to show you something I've never taught on YouTube before. And so for those of you that are longtime followers of our work, this is a new concept that you need to understand. In every website, there's traffic coming in. Let's let this circle represent all of that traffic. The problem is not all of that traffic will or could or should convert. So you may say to me, my conversion rate, I'm going to make these numbers ridiculous. That way it's easy to learn. You might say to me that my conversion rate is, uh, is only 1% and it's too low and can you fix this? 
And when you come to someone like uh, an analyst from our team or a scientist, we've spent $138 million and more than 20 years studying this, and you'd think we might just come in here and change something, and instantly you see your conversion rate go up. And that does happen a lot, but not before we ask ourselves a different question. We ask ourselves, what is the UPC? Now learn from this. I see it all the time. What is the UPC? UPC stands for the universe of possible conversions. So within all the traffic coming to the page we looked at for the media cable company, there was only a smaller percentage inside of that circle that represented the UPC. The rest of these could never be converted. So you're not going to see the conversion rate suddenly jump dramatically. Now, these are not the numbers, this 1%. I'm going to take this outside of that illustration, take it to your website. Let's suppose your website's converting at 1%, but what if 90% of your traffic is the wrong traffic? Then the universe of possible conversions is much lower than you think. And so you may find out that your true conversion rate is 10%, but you don't understand that and you're trying to fix the wrong problem. Now, we had this very specifically with this uh, cable and media group because many people there did not even qualify. They weren't even in an area they could serve as they moved. More importantly, they were just coming there to cancel and they couldn't figure out how to cancel. So they called the customer service team and they complained profusely. The first thing we wanted to do then was give them a way to get out of our traffic mix. And so we ran an experiment, which I'll not show you today, that narrowed it down to simply those people who we could reach. In fact, we put a link on the page, more prominent, that allowed those who needed to cancel just to get off and out of the funnel. Then we got to a clear understanding of what our UPC was. Then we improved conversion. Now that 10% increase is not just on the UPC, but that's on all traffic coming to the page. And so ultimately it was a much more profound impact than you can measure by the 10%. So let's review. We're getting ready to look at live pages. One, two, I've shared with you an important principle, the power of naming. Three, I want you to walk away understanding the UPC, that there is a universe of possible conversions and one of the best ways to improve your performance is to get this sort of uh, understanding out of your data. All right, if that's helping you, let me take you a step further, all right? Because there is another issue. In fact, I can, I can cash this in by, by simply taking you to a page submitted by somebody in our audience. This came from one of our YouTube uh, attendees. This is a page that can be helped, but can somebody identify a problem on this page directly connected to what I've been teaching? What is it? Oh, and Yakov, this is your page. All right, well, first of all, Yakov, uh, I, uh, I wanna thank you. I see your name on here all of the time. Secondly, you know I'm gonna be direct and hard to try and get a a powerful increase for you. Thirdly, uh, when I do that, I become a customer in my mind. So forgive me if I'm all in on being super critical the way customers are, uh, but understand that I'm on your side and we want you to see a win, all right? Now, I'm gonna start by just focusing on the power of one principle. I can't do the whole page, uh, not in depth, or we won't learn anything other than general ideas. So let's just think about that naming principle. How could you use that right now? Somebody tell me. All right, Juan says there's no value proposition. Uh, fraud Fighter says my first assumption was a massage service or similar, okay. Uh, and from his Torah Observant Women, it is a Jewish site. Uh, and Yaakov, my head of editorial, uh, Dan is uh, Jewish. And, um, uh, but let me continue. Is from Mother's Morning Guide, is that a, is, is, what does that mean? When you say more, is, is that the name? It says download your guide now. Here's my point that might help you. I would try to use a name that implied a value. Now think about that. I don't know if the name of this guide, neither does the customer, is from Mother's Morning Guide. I know that when I see the form, it says download your guide now. And 
and, and that's the right idea, but there's no name there, and there's no benefit implied by the name. Now, remember the name we gave to the form before it was called Quick Mobile Transfer. It was designed for mobile users, and it was designed to be quick, and it implied by the name that it was going to be quick. So one way to help you uh, with this particular page is to think of how to name this in such a way as to produce more impact on the conclusion set that precedes the decision to purchase. You following the logic of that? Now, Yaakov, because it's you, because I see you so much, I'm going to go a bit further, and I just want to share this with you. In addition to that, if you go back to our fulcrum, what we haven't done here is relieve anxiety. You've done a good job of saying, we will not spam, rent, or sell your information. Good. But what happens when I, with my name afterwards, do you call me and trouble me? Do I get my guide instantly? Uh, do I get it by email? Do I download it here? Is this the beginning of a, a big sales effort? A lot of things are not clear, and thus anxiety is being created, and anxiety is more lethal than friction. So you need to be very careful. All I want to do right now, though, is focus on the idea that uh, with the name, and in this case, the call to action, we can imply value. For instance, do I get my guide instantly? You might say, well, that's redundant. A lot of good marketing is redundant. Do I get it instantly? And, uh, and, uh, and in addition to that, what is the guide? So let me, let me pretend I was fixing that one piece with you. And everybody with a download, pay attention to this. And then I'm going to take you to something really interesting. I'm going to talk about fish. And we're going to learn from fish how to improve your marketing. I know that sounds crazy, but let's see if it's true. Give me just a couple of minutes of your time and I'll shift to the fish. But first, <laughs> I want to work on this form. So, by the way, for everybody listening to me, all the things I've been teaching over these many weeks and months and across the years are being wired into a customer psychology lab, a piece of software that one day I'm going to let you participate with me on as we test. It's the most powerful way I know to apply what you're hearing here. But for now, here is this form. So I have two form fields and a button. I'm just going to represent those form fields. This is the button. I have one little bit of anxiety relief right here. I have a name. I have uh, no subheader, just instructions. And so this is the existing form. Let, uh, just to make it clear, I'll, I'll use this, those straight lines to represent fields, and I'll use these lines to represent text. All right, so... This is the field, this is a field, and of course these other pieces are text. And this is your call to action. All right, now, the one thing that you need to do right now that would help me dramatically is punch up the left side of the fulcrum. So let's look at our fulcrum, you all remember this, but I'm trying to do this with you so you can do it yourself on your own pages. On this side is perceived value, not actual value. Let's suppose that that guide is life-changing. That doesn't matter. It's not true value until it's perceived. It's not true for the person you're trying to serve. So the person who comes here needs to understand some cool things that make this guide really appealing. And those things need to be offset by mitigating any anxiety or friction or negative psychological elements. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to give you ways. In fact, rather than write on here, I'm going to suggest because it'll be faster if I do so. Number one, I need a picture of the guide. Number two, it should be an attractive graphic that reaches out and makes me want to pick it up and hold it. It should not be a flat, one-dimensional picture. It should have a drop shadow. It should have depth. Number two, I need a description of the guide. I need to know how many pages it is. If it is really long, tell me it's comprehensive. If it's really short, tell me it's executive summary. In each case, I've used a name, do you hear me? I've used a name or a descriptor to create a positive conclusion from what might be perceived as a negative. So, give me a picture. Describe it. As you describe it, give me facts that are quantitative. The quantitative facts are things like how long it is, how big it is, who wrote it, um, how many copies have been downloaded, information that is instantly credible 
because you define it specifically and squeeze out all the ambiguity that is a typical tool for those who don't have value. They get ambiguous. They speak with vague words. They call themselves leading. They say they're fast, but now how fast? They say they're leading, but they don't spell out their number one. They say they have a huge inventory, but don't tell you how much it is. In all cases where I don't have a good answer, it is human nature to move to ambiguity. In fact, if you want to get into the deeper psychology, any parent with children has seen this. When, when a child breaks something, they typically don't say, Dad, I broke X. They say, uh, it got broken. And you think that's, you think that's uh, humorous. You should watch the adults in a scenario sitting around a table trying to explain a business problem, how everything moves from first person. And we slip away from saying, I did this, made this mistake, and we talk in this sort of uh, ambiguous way as if it got broken by itself. Now, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get off track, but there is subtle, nuanced psychology in every aspect of your communication. So, over here now, we're assuming that we've done some work that makes this better. And the first thing we've done is we've added a, a three-dimensional picture of the guide. And that picture helps us understand and, and, and sense that it has, you know, value. And it's attractive. And then in addition to that, we've used a subheader to tell me that, I don't need you to tell me, look, enter your name and email. Well, you can say name in the form field. You can say email in the form field. That second piece of text, first of all, is the wrong color. It's light on a background that makes it hard to read. Secondly, it adds no value. It should be a subheader that describes this thing as being amazing. And underneath it should be two or three high important, I would say three to five bullet points. And the bullet points help explain the, the essential value of this. And then if you wanna make it even stronger, right underneath this button, put testimonials. And those testimonials are from, if possible, high authority figures. But don't make them vague. Don't make them from an anonymous person. And if possible, make it from a name they recognize. You can't always do that, but that's ideal. So now, we're starting to deal with friction, we're starting to deal with anxiety, we've punched up value, and this fulcrum, the perceived value, this fulcrum is starting to tip. And it's tipping this way in favor of value. And they realize, wow, now anybody that's studied our work on the value proposition knows this. This little piece has its own product or process level value proposition, separate from your business. So they need to absorb this and conclude four things. They need to understand it, they need to believe, that's the foundation. Then they need to say inside, they need to conclude that it's appealing and that so, thus I want it. And then they need to conclude, I can't get it anywhere else. If they make those four conclusions, if they subconsciously understand it, subconsciously believe it, and then conclude they want it and they can't get it anywhere else, the power of this fulcrum tips way down here and conversion does what, everyone? It goes way up. Are you following the logic? Is this helping you? Oh, where's the big name? I see something about the big name under the direction of, okay, good, good, that helps. Anything else you can do is good, but that's the right idea. And I'm watching to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm helping you. I see positive comments. Yakov, make changes and submit it to us and we'll look at it as a favor. Or get into a quick win consult or intensive where I can really work on it with you. But I wanna see you gain. I would also suggest without going any further because I've gotta go to other pages, is that image on the right hand side needs to be a stronger image. It doesn't communicate enough. Yes, it does show a mother holding hands with children. Yes, it's better than some things, but you'd be better off with a picture of the guide. You'd be better off with something strong there that communicates the value proposition. I will stop there. Let me ask the audience, use your chat feature and tell me, is this helping you too? Because I want to help my friend, and he really is a friend. I know we're not best friends. We'll never golf together, Yakov, but you've been on here a lot. And I'm in business for meaningful relationships or I don't want to be in business. I don't even like the way business is done in most cases. But for me, I see you, I appreciate you so, I wanna help you, but I'd also like to help other people. So uh, is this helping you as you think about your own forms? Tell me, good Sean, thank you. Dave, thank you. 
Uh, and, <laughs> and Dave, I caught that. All right, good. Are you ready to go another one? I'm going to take you another one. We're going to work on it. And D Dave, I don't know how to golf. Uh, the last time I went, yes, I, I don't know how to golf. I've never golfed because I thought if I start, took up golfing, I'd have to give up fishing or something else, and I don't know how I would survive. However, maybe you can, he says it's lame. Uh, maybe uh, cut him off, would you please? Just, just, just drop him. I'm kidding, all right? Sailing is cool, Doug. All right, take a look with me now. I want to talk about fish. These are all pictures of the same fish. And I promised that I would give you some meaningful marketing information around that fish that we saw at the beginning. Does anybody know what kind of fish this is? If so, now is your key opportunity. We didn't catch them a lot during early years. In fact, uh, they were such, they were deep water fish. Famous uh, because a lot of them come from the Arctic Circle. Some come off the coast of South America. All right, I'm seeing names. It is not a monkfish, but Robert, i tell you something interesting about monkfish. Uh, that's not really the name either. It used to be called a goosefish. We'll talk about names. Doug Week says it's ugly. Yeah, doesn't look very appetizing, does it? It's not a sturgeon. And Sean, you're sort of right and you're dead wrong at the same time. Not your fault. Looks, you know, uh, I'll tell you what it really is and then I'll tell you my story. By the way, if you've just tuned in, we're going to work through live pages helping you improve your conversion optimization. And believe it or not, this fish is critical to understanding how to make your pages perform better. So here's the actual official article in my hand uh, with a lot of science and statistics and surveys. But I just want to cut to the chase and tell you a little bit about what you're looking at. First of all, that is originally called a Patagonian toothfish. And it is a toothfish, ugly. And uh, if you look at it from different perspectives, I've seen it really ugly. This is not the ugliest picture I could, I, I, I could find, but it's one we found quick just to put this into the teaching today. The Patagonian toothfish is a trash fish that was thrown away for, for years when it got tangled in people's nets. That's the commercial fishermen. They despised it because it would get really tangled because of uh, all the spines. And, uh, and so we threw them away by the thousands and pounds and tons and tons over many years. But in 1977, a very expert marketer changed everything. He changed everything, meaning he impacted the culinary habits of the entire world. He created an industry. And he sold subsequently tons and tons and tons and tons of this toothfish. How did he change perception? Marketer, that is the capital question. If you can answer that question, you can learn something that will help you change perception. So, tell me again, it's a toothfish. Would you like to know what we call it today? Because in 1977, he changed the name. And just to be more specific, his, uh, his name is Lance, L-A-N-T-Z, Lee Lance. 77 was the year that he changed it. I've highlighted some pieces on this article that I'm just pulling back. And, uh, and uh, he found it scouring fishing boats. It was trash fish in a Chilean port. And he thought, hmm, nobody wants this. If I could create a market for it, they're everywhere. Commercial fishing has exhausted uh, you know, the, many of our prime and prize fish stocks. In fact, today they say that, for instance, tuna is 90% uh, depleted. He needed to find something else. And there's a trend in the commercial fishing market of finding trash fish and turning them into a delicacy. You may have heard of some of these trash fish. I'll give you an example. One today that we often hear used to be called, and I have the name right here, uh, a slime head. How many of you would go to a restaurant and order a slime head? I have two slime heads, please. Now don't laugh because somebody changed that name to an orange roughy and it's on the menus everywhere. Same fish. Same, at the same time, this, uh, this brilliant marketer tasted this fish. He fried it up in oil and he said, 
He was disappointed. It had almost no taste. And then he realized, wait a second, that's exactly what I need. Something that we can give taste to as a chef. If it has that sort of neutral taste, we can give it any flavor we want. And I can end up selling garbage for a profit. What other people perceive as garbage. Are you ready for the rest? <laughs> Load kill restaurant. David Carey said lionfish. They're trying to do that lionfish now. They've done it with sea urchin. It is a Chilean sea bass. And it's on the menu everywhere. Isn't that fascinating? By changing the name, just like a slime fish to an orange roughy, by changing the name of this ugly, toothy fish that nobody wanted, he was able to change the perception. And you can say, well, what else did he do? Well, he sold a ton of them, but just ask yourself a question. How important was the name of the change? Huge. How many of you would have ordered a toothfish? A Patagonian toothfish? Had you seen it on the menu? Not many. What's interesting is the Chilean sea bass, most of them aren't caught off the coast of Chile. There's a lot in Chile, but they're actually from the Arctic. It has a sort of codfish. It's in the codfish family but it's an ugly fish that nobody wanted till its name was changed. Sounds like a fairy tale. And it was for this man who made a fortune. For you and I, it's a lesson we ought to learn. On our web pages, use the power of the name to control perception. So, I see David Carrier on the line. David, how, all the names for your products and particularly, because you, David provides trust services uh, in a, you got to, Talk about him before in other YouTube channels, other YouTube presentations. Changing the name of your seminars, potentially your forms, any process, all of those things. And David, knowing the way you're thinking, using a name that implies how you champion for the middle class could be really powerful. And so uh, onward we go, all right? We've learned about Patagonian Toothfish. We've learned about UPC, Universe of Possible Conversions. Uh, we have optimized the page, and we've also thought through the conclusions, and we've learned about the power of a name. Now, if I had more time, I'd take you through a journey in the time to the Aristotelian, Aristotelian syllogism. Because if you understand a syllogism, you'll understand how to use a name in order to create a conclusion. But time won't let me go there today. It's, I didn't set this in here to bait you. I'm going to move to more pages. But... The logic involved in a syllogism is the logic we involve in branding and naming if we want to stay ahead of everyone else. Later, if you want to know more about that, write us, tell me, and I'll teach it more. It's also in one of our courses. I am going to, uh, uh, see a skulking shyster, David. I am going to go to another page. So let's go past all this to a page that was submitted by someone in our audience. It is get the most versatile video wall solution on the market. Now, I just want to stop there, pull up the real page to Paul have it ready, but this is the top of the page. Can anybody see an issue based on what I've just taught about the way this page is communicating? Take a quick look and tell me. Use your chat feature and tell me. By the way, if today is helpful, hit the subscribe button, please. Hit the like button and share. That's the first time I got it right and early in the program, too. Paul's nodding at me approvingly. I did it, all right? So... Uh, because obviously we want to grow the community. Take a look here now, and what is one thing you could do right now to make this page more powerful using something we just spoke about when we talked about Chilean sea bass? There's nothing specific. There's nothing quantitative. Somebody said the word most means nothing. You're right in all of that. I don't know what it is, but, it, but I want it for my media room. Good. Versatile how, okay, bad image, bad name. What is the name? Somebody tell me what the name is. I don't see a name. I don't think Innovative Video Wave Systems is the name of the product, and if it is, you can't tell. They don't use it anywhere I can see other than in a tiny blue on white lettering at the top, and it doesn't, it doesn't really imply any of the specific value. One of the first things I do is ask myself, do I have the right conceptual handle to pick up this product concept with and carry it to other people. A name is like a handle. It represents a whole. It's a concept uh, shorthand. 
But if you pick the right shorthand, that can make all the difference. So I ask you again, does this page use naming in a smart way? No, it does not. And there then is an application of what we just spoke about. Now, uh, I don't know if the user is on here. Wait a second, user fools unique architecture. I see the way, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, maybe that's the attempt at a name. Uh, clearly it's capitalized. That's the brand, if I'm not mistaken. Paul believes it's the brand. If we're here arguing about it, we have a problem. But Paul believes it's the brand, and not necessarily the product. Uh, I think it could be obviously improved a great deal. But let's, let's go ahead and scroll through the page. Let's go full screen on the page. And I need you guys to look at the page and give me three changes you'd make. Just start with one. The most important move you'd make on this page. Somebody tell me. It's a landing page. I don't know the difference, by the way, between userful and innovative video wave systems. What are those two pieces? How do they relate? It's difficult for me to understand, but I'm watching. Uh, Chili and Wally TVs, <laughs> said David. Differentiate the size of the boxes, says David. Bullet points, says uh, KN. Uh, fraud fighter says primary value of using a video wall. Get rid of turquoise font. Yes, that's good. Pictures of people, maybe. Uh, they're all equal. Uh, there is no humanity. So true, Robert. All right, so now let's get practical about this. Here's the first thing you need to look at. Remember, we've been teaching this over and over again in the past, but in different ways. And I'm going to bring you out of the normal content, which is all about the three questions. Where am I at? What can I do here? Why should I do it? The power of a headline, how to use it, capture attention, create interest. These are standard things. If you haven't learned them from us, go back to previous videos. I just want to look at this, thinking about how the page is flowing. So let's just start at the top and, and notice that we have this sort of design. Let's just scroll down, Paul, I'm looking. Scroll down so I can see too. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just what I thought. This is your page design. It flows like this. And when it does, you know, each of these corners represents a new message. See the messages? So we have messages moving left, you know, moving left to right to left. And then notice something else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to further distinguish the problem with the page by using this colored marker to help you see that essentially we have cutoffs. Think of these as walls. Why are they walls? Because I read this complete set of text and then I have another complete set of text over here on the right. And what I need to know is, does this text connect to this text? Is this a separate offer? Is this the same offer? Uh, and is it this, this, and is this a third offer? Uh, I notice that everywhere I see is download pricing sheet. Am I getting pricing sheets for the same thing or are these each different things? So often what we do is we guess. We don't know what to say. So we say multiple things and then we slap them on the page somewhere like this and we hope that somewhere one of these is going to connect. But the ultimate problem is that the eye path does not serve a fluid, flowing, mental conversation. Your eye path must, must draw people through and into a conversation with you. What I have is a series of distinct conversations with no understanding as to how they connect. Now, if I sat down and worked through this page, I'd understand that. But remember, the person coming to this page is in a hurry. They have other places they can look besides you, or they think they do, and they're not going to sit here and work really hard to make meaning of this page unless they're highly motivated. Scroll to the bottom, all the way down to the bottom. When I get to the bottom, I have something that might belong at the top of the page. Get started with our video wall pricing sheet. You'll find all you need to know to deploy a successful video wall. They have the right idea down here. Now, the three bullets should be stronger. Retail pricing, okay, product comparison, that's good. Feature right down, all three things, good things. But not uh, compelling. Maybe, maybe a little bit of additional text explaining. And, and what is this pricing sheet? They got a picture of it. They have downloaded the pricing sheet. Let's click on the button. Here we go. All right. Boom. 
Now, somebody tell me what's wrong with this. Tell me right now what's wrong with this. Elad, I think you're correct. This does need longer copy in a solid conversation that flows naturally. It also needs the form on the page. How many of you, when a pop-up comes, automatically shut it down? The problem with this page is, number one, it takes you to a different page to interact and request. Number two, it takes me through a process that looks very long for a free download. Three steps. Number three, it offers no value on the form whatsoever. It offers no anxiety relief. I have no protection for privacy. I don't know if a salesman's gonna pester me. And if you go back to the conversation we had at the beginning to help Yakov, even though they've got a picture and even though they've got some elements like we described, what they don't have is anything mitigating the negative side of the fulcrum. There's anxiety and there's friction and worse, a lot of pages are gonna block that pop-up. Even when you click on it, it won't come up. Now, I haven't seen how they execute in mobile, but it could be another problem in mobile. So if you're listening to this and you wanna get the most value, the first thing I would do is create a, an eloquent single conversation. And the second thing I would do is I would bring the form onto the page and I would keep it short as you can possibly make it, simple and easy, and then I would mitigate friction and I would mitigate anxiety. Audience, does that make sense to you? Are you following with me? Is this helping you? Kevin Clark said, good grief. I don't know if that means good grief, that's the most boring speaker I ever heard, or good grief, this page needs help, or good grief, I need help, I don't know. But Kevin, I'm gonna go with one of the positive uh, pieces of that and, and, and let's keep rolling. All right, we don't have much time left. Let's go to another page. All right, another page, fast. Let's, here we are. Identify verification document authentication. What's the problem with the top line of this page right now? What is the problem with the whole, let, let's just focus right here for a second. Uh, I do want you to scroll down in a minute. But what, I've taught this already and this is a, this is a bit of a test for my audience. What are they doing wrong at the top of the page? Somebody tell me. Not a headline, not a complete thought, correct? It's ugly and stupid. <laughs> That's a fraud fighter saying that. Uh, it's not a headline, it's a title. Uh, what's unique? Uh, yeah, let's, let's just start with the first words on the page. They shouldn't be white in all caps against an image background. Right off the bat, you know, Form and substance are difficult. Balthazar, the, the philosopher monk, talked about the distinction between the two. I would tell you that in marketing, form and substance meld so tightly it's hard to separate them. But in this case, the, the substance is the message and the form is like the way that font hits the page. And first of all, even if it was an amazing headline, it's difficult to read because it's non serif all caps, with white uh, text on a gray image background. Secondly, to David's point and others, there's no thought here. You just have a name, identity verification and document authentication. It's not even a name name. It's just a sort of a, a identification of what kind of thing this is. And, uh, and then you say, customize the perfect solution for your business. Again, in all caps, on a button that doesn't look like a button, with only three words above it, none of them complete thoughts, quick, confident, secure. I do not know enough to want you to customize anything for me yet. Now, I'm not trying to be hard on the fraud fighter guys. Listen, I'm grateful to have you on here. I'm trying to think like a customer and I have to get out of my blind self-interest and into their skin. And what I'm trying to tell you is we've wasted the entire screen. The top of the page is doing nothing to help move me into relationship. In fact, I'll bet you have a high bounce rate. Unless they're coming from something very compelling. I've seen them have, I've seen this work when they're coming from a TV commercial. I'm sure they're not but where there's a lot of other selling first, what we have going on here is you tell me the category this is, you make three claims that are unverified, it's quick, it's confident, secure, I don't really know what it is, I don't even know if it's software, I don't know exactly what it is at this point. Then you, you tell me to customize the perfect solution, but what, what does that mean? I, what businesses do you serve? Is this for small businesses, for big businesses? And, Customization, is that some extra cost that I pay? Is there a standard and then customization? Like, the, the, nothing here aligns with a sequence of thought. So what's going on is that when someone comes to your page, think of it as a physical journey. And they put one foot on the page, I'm stepping forward, it's hard to see, 
I'm stepping forward. They put one foot on the page. The back foot's in the search engine. They look around. If they don't see what they expect, they pick the front foot back up and go back to the search engine and they go somewhere else and do the same thing. And that enriches Google, which is that great casino in the cloud. And so you, uh, on the other hand, are not enriched. You just lost your chance to talk to them. And in the moments that we're spending right now discussing this, people are doing this on that page. There's not enough there to get my back foot onto the page and into the conversation. By the way, for those of you that would like to make fun of me, I'm, I'm in shorts again today <laughs> because I came straight out of a meeting, threw on my coat. I had about three minutes prep to walk in here. But ultimately, you've got to use the top of the page to get an incremental commitment. Did everybody hear that? When you ask for too big a commitment, the answer is no. You're asking for too big a commitment here. You're asking me to customize the perfect solution for my business. I don't know enough to want to click on a button, go anywhere else, give you even another click. You haven't earned another click yet. And until you earn that click, you're going to lose people who are not motivated or who don't already know a lot about you. So start by giving me a meaningful sentence. Give me a strong subheader and tell me enough information to get me into the text below. I do see that there is what Paladin does beneath there. But that's in the wrong order. I, I need, you're never gonna get to tell me that story beneath here because you're not gonna get enough of my attention because you've wasted all that space at the top of the page where you could have made a genuine connection. So ultimately, we've gotta rearrange this page so that there's enough meaning in the first few seconds to get me to make an incremental commitment to get down into the body of the message. Does that make sense for everyone? And, uh, and I see some interesting comments about spelling and so on. All right, Kevin Clark says, I think the word uh, protect should be there. But honestly, this is not a page to make some optimization changes on. You need to test a whole different approach. Let's scroll down just for a moment. Look at the balance of the page. All right, look at all this good stuff down here. That's too many bullet points, by the way. Uh, hard for people, you need three to five or it's lost on them. You would, you would simplify this text by layering it and sequencing it when they click deeper. Keep going. I see key features and I see Paladin details. Um, I don't know what they mean, but I'll tell you this, centered text like that is difficult to read. It looks like a whole series of headlines stacked on top of each other. And by the way, I don't think that's, it may be my monitor, but I don't know if that's black on white or gray on white. It doesn't have, it's not crisp and which makes it harder to read. Then I have the Paladin process, but let me ask you a question. What's the difference between the Paladin process and how it works, which was above that? And what you've done is you've sort of thrown everything on the page, stacked it on top of each other, and hope something works. There's not a logical flow, and it's really difficult to make meaning out of this. And so I would come up with a much different approach. All right, I am running out of time. Where am I at, Paul? Do I have time for another page? Yeah, 10 minutes left. Good. All right. So, audience, are you, is this working for you? Is the way we're approaching this helping you? Give me that feedback again. Don't forget, if it is, to, to like and subscribe and share. Let me see, and we'll go to another page if you'd like me to, and we'll work on that together, okay? So, let's pull it up. Here we go. All right. Paul's bringing me to a page, and I have, cardio will never, why does it keep clicking off, Paul? Paul is, Paul is dueling with me. I had a very, a very kind and gracious, well-meaning uh, listener, uh, audience member last week write me and say she loved the presentation, but she didn't like me humiliating Paul. And I appreciated her, her concern for that. I went back and checked with Paul, but, I, but we, we, it's our culture here. We laugh and tease and joke all the time. And most of the time I'm looking at him, he's got a silly grin on his face, especially when I make a mistake. All right, here we go. Cardi will never be boring again. All right. There is uh, all caps again. Not too hard to read though, it's red on white. Uh, I, would be, I would question the color. Red typically has a psychological, we've measured this. It typically signifies danger or a warning. And you, uh, you may have been red to tie into the heart. Okay, but be careful about your color choice. We are proud distributors. Let's stop right there. Somebody tell me what's wrong with the first four words of text underneath the headline. And I'll tell you what's wrong above that. I'm listening. I'm watching for your text. That's what my version of listening is. Let me see. That's right, Juan. That's exactly right. It starts with, we are proud. Who the hell cares that you're proud? I mean this nicely, but the truth of the matter is, don't begin with yourself. 
begin with the other. And don't tell me that you're proud. It, you're on the wrong foot with the first four words out of your mouth. So you've got to start with the other person and you've got to see the problem through their eyes. And so the entire approach is in the wrong uh, position. Now let's go above that. Cardio will never be boring again. Now I'm going to, this is a piece of psychology. I'm going to pretend this is the text. Let's learn. We got nine minutes. Let's learn something new. If you'd like to learn something new that you can apply, then pay close attention and I won't, I'll do my best not to waste a single minute, especially talking about Paul. All right. So whenever you make a statement like that, let's, let's take it. Cardio will never be boring again. I'm not going to write it. I'm going to illustrate it up here. So there's your headline. Cardio will never be boring again. Here's what you do, marketer. David, this is what you do with your agency or with us or with your team. And, and I'm talking to David Carrier and, and others on here. Here's what you do. You take that question and you attack it with something uh, I call the chain of whys. The chain of whys gets you to the meaningful, substantive statement that you really need to be using in that headline. Tell me something. Uh, if you were here in the room and you were the marketer and we were doing a quick win intensive, I'd say to you, Tell me why cardio will never be boring again. And you'll give me an answer. And I'll say, well, tell me why that is so. And you'll give me an answer. And I'll keep hitting you with this, this, this question. It's like a spade. And I'm digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Now look, Juan said, turn any exercise bike into a fun, immersive workout. Moving in the right direction, Juan. Uh, you'll hardly ever be bored by cardio again. M both of those are much better than what we have yet. Make cardio fun, interesting, exciting, says Fra you guys are moving in the right direction. So get beneath, but keep, let, let me go, let me apply this to Juan. Um, turn any exercise bike into a fun, immersive workout. Or let's, I could take that one, that's a good one, but I'll go to David. You'll hardly ever be bored again. Okay, but by cardio. So, so Dave, why? Why will you never be bored again? And we go down deeper. And David gives me the answer. And I ask why. And somebody gives me the answer, and I ask why, until I get to the root bottom of what is the essence of your identity that gives you the value proposition to start with. And that is where you, that's the raw materials of your headline. That's the raw materials of your value proposition. That's the raw materials of what you have to offer in the world of commerce. And even if uh, evolution, uh, as a theory, because it is still a theory, is mistaken, and I'm not saying it is, but I, I think we forget it's a theory. The world certainly evolves, and in the evolutionary marketplace, if you don't get this right, you become extinct. You're just like a Tyrannosaurus Rex or a Brontosaurus. You've lost relevance to your context, and so you starve to death. With that in mind, I would go back to every single person on this call, and I would look at the headline at the top of my page, and I would say, why is that so? Until you get to the platform, the position everything else is standing on, you haven't really got to the compelling language that will get someone to pay attention. So I think, for instance, where David went and where Juan went and uh, Elad and Fraud Fighter is all in the right direction. In fact, you, you do better with those headlines than the one we have here. But ultimately, get down to the essence and that's where, now listen, here's the next thing. Sometimes you can't say it in one headline, and that's why that interim, that, you understand, it's just another little bit more commitment, just a tiny more commitment to read the subheader. That's why a great subheader underneath this, sometimes longer than the big text, but not as small as your body text, is one other micro step. Not asking for too much more, just read the headline, the subheadline. If this headline, says something at the foundation that gets me to read this subheadline, my odds of getting you to read what comes below goes way up. So um, I would suggest cardio will never be boring again, can be improved based on what we've said, and then get to the text beneath us. We are proud distributors. We, that's wrong. Proud, miss, it's the right idea, but it connotates negative thoughts. Distributors, boring, B2B word, ugly, of the VC sensor for Singapore. That is finally 
where you're going, but this is a point middle sentence. Do you see that? VC sensors in the middle. I've taught point middle and point first and point last. It's a point middle sentence. So the entire sentence needs to be burned up and started over. But look, look what comes after that. You know, marketers know down inside. They just don't know that they know. I have rarely met a marketer that didn't know what the headline could be if I asked them the right questions. The reality is that we are our own worst enemy and we get in the way. And this is what I'm going to close with, marketer. On our pages, you'll see they're starting to get there. You can turn any exercise bike into a fun, immersive workout. It starts with you. It has that concept of any exercise bike. A fun, immersive workout. I question the word immersive. I know it sounds cool, but I'm not learning a language. I'm trying to work out. I want a better word than immersive. It's gray. And in my mind's eye, it's a gray, blurry blob of a word that doesn't have any distinct crisp edges with uh, the sort of textual color that appeals to my soul. And that's the word you need as the modifier in front of workout. And, uh, and then it says, through the power of VR, assuming we all know what VR is, uh, and maybe they do, maybe all your prospective customers do, but I don't know. But now it's saying something else, so they'll stay motivated and get the results you want quicker. It's starting to get to the point that you need at the top of the page. So the good news is, if you submitted this page and you've asked for help, and for everyone on here that's listening to me, the key to a transformed set of marketing results is a transformed marketer. And guess what? You don't need to change who you are. You probably don't need to go get a, an MBA in marketing. You need to change how you see the world and thus how you communicate to it. Because the answer that you're looking for is not out there, it's in here. Now all I want to help you do in these times that we spend together is dig out those answers and let you begin to see your page through customer eyes and suddenly you understand. What I think about many of you on this call is you probably underestimate the quality of what you can do. Truly, you have more capabilities than you realize and this is not, you know, I'm 54 years of age. I'm not gonna hype you with flattery. It's just been my experience that many marketers who don't think they know, they do know. They just don't know that they know. I'll close with this quote that my dad taught me when I was a little boy, it's an Arab proverb. It says, he who knows not, it's not in my notes, I'm doing it from memory, I might mess it up. He who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool, shun him. He who knows and knows not that he knows is asleep, awake him. He who knows not and knows not that he knows as a child, teach him. He who knows and knows that he knows is a leader. Follow him. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back next week with more.